You ever wonder about how to get the very best sound out of your desktop audio system? That's the topic we're gonna to be covering in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delasala with Audioholics. I wanna to talk to you about how you can get the best possible sound from your desktop audio system. If you're like me, you spend a lot of time at your computer doing work, answering emails, surfing the web, whatever. And I'm sure you're doing a lot of listening at your desktop. I know back in my old house, I did most of my music listening while I was working in my office. This house is a little different because I got separate music rooms for that occasion, but it's still a re very relevant topic. We recently published an article, James Larson wrote an excellent article on the audiohawks.com website. I'll link it down below. He gets into all these different details of everything you want to consider. I want to kind of go over the highlights of that to give you a more digestible view on it. And then for those that want to read further, you're welcome to read the article. So I want to start with sharing my screen. And here we go. All right. Let me just zoom in on this. So anyways, the article is here on the Audioholics website. It's in our DIY audio and wiring section. And there's just some tips here that are really worth going over with you I wanted to share. First thing is uh, most people are putting their speakers on their desktop where their computer is. There's pros and cons to that. The pro is you're in the near field of that speaker, so you're getting more of the direct energy, which can potentially be very good. It takes some of the room acoustics out of the equation but there's also a lot of things around that surface that can reflect and mess up the sound. So it's always a good idea, step one, is to get these speakers off the desk, decouple them from the desk so they don't resonate on the desk is a good option. You can either buy like isoacoustic pads for it, Orlex makes the Orlex Mo pad. I'll put a link in the description down below. Or you can just get rubber feet. You know, you could go to Home Depot or, to, or your local hardware store and you can get rubber feet to help decouple the speaker from the surface. Ideally, you want to raise the speaker level up a little bit, get it away from anything that's reflecting, whether it's a keyboard. It's always a good practice right there. So that's step one about elevating your speakers. And then you can see here is an article. This is um, this is the isoacoustics um it's a bracket that you basically put under the speaker and you can angle it. It decouples it. It's a bit pricey, but you can, it get, definitely gets the job done. Or you can look at, like I said, the Orlex Mopeds, very good options here. And you can see that the speakers are above any surfaces on the desk that are going to be causing any major issues. And it gets it at a nice level and it's tilted back down towards the listening area so that you're not listening to the tweeter too far off axis. So that's really good. Now, the other option is sometimes people have their speakers up really high on stands, like in this example. This is a problem because now you're listening really far off axis from that tweeter. In this case, if you're gonna listen to a speaker that's that high up, it's usually a good idea to flip it upside down so the tweeter is closer to ear level and put the mid-range higher up. Your axis of integration is usually somewhere between the mid-range and the tweeter. So getting that, Flipping that speaker can really help uh, improve the sound. That's another option for you. If you're putting speakers too close to a wall, it's always a good idea to put absorption on that wall. What happens if you put a speaker near a wall is it loads um, more bass into the room, which you're listening to. It's called um, standing waves, and you get boundary reinforcement as well. So by putting some absorption um, when I'm talking about the one inch fuzz, that stuff is useless. One inch foam is basically killing your highs, but it's not really absorbing the mid base area where you need it. So you really need a good three or four inch thick absorption panel. As James says here, four inch panel would be better. Two inches is okay, but really four inches is better. So if you're putting a speaker near a wall, put the absorption behind the speaker or to the side wall of the speaker, and that'll really help improve it. You Remember, you're doing a near field listening Try to get the, the sound that's coming from that speaker directly at you without coloring it with too many surfaces or too many reflections is a good idea. Now, if the speaker is rear ported, in other words, there's a port on the back of the speaker, it's a, it's a base 
reflex design. Um, you generally don't want to put that up right against the wall because that can cause acoustical problems as well. So you have two options. If you have to put that speaker up against the wall, you can plug the port. You could stick port plugs in there. You could stick a sock or whatever you need to do. Or ideally, if you want to get that extra bass output of the speaker that, uh, that because it's a ported enclosure, just get that speaker at least a th two or three inches off that wall. Preferably a little bit more is a good idea. So that's the other step uh, when you're dealing with rear ported speakers. You might want to consider getting a sealed speaker if you know it's going to be up against the wall. And if you need to uh, supplement the base, we'll talk about how to do that as well. So another thing to do is experiment with toe-in. What I mean by toe-in is you angle the speakers towards the listener. You want to ultimately create the best phantom center you can get out of a pair of speakers for that one listener. This is the time where you don't really care about multiple listening seats because it's a near field. It's just for you. Tow those speakers in, you know, kind of like an equilateral triangle. Listen to music that's very vocal content oriented. Um, I listen to a lot of like Diane Reeves, um, anything really, Michael Jackson, anything that has a really strong vocal presence in the sound, especially female vocals. I, I tend to lock in on female vocals when I'm setting up speakers for imaging. Um, just keep towing those speakers in until you feel like you've got the right angles for those speakers where you're getting that center image dead center uh, between the speakers and it just sounds good to you. Sometimes though, if you tow a speaker in too much and it's a bright speaker, it could be too um, treble oriented and it could be fatiguing. So in that case, you might want to tow them out a little bit, push them a little bit further apart. There's, you know, different things or you might even have to use tone controls and we'll talk about that as well. So here's the big thing. Most of the time you're putting small speakers on a desktop because you're just limited in space and there's not a lot of bass in those situations. So this is the perfect time to add a, sub, a subwoofer. And if you look at it like an S, SVS has their uh, 3000 series, the Micro 3000, that's the perfect kind of subwoofer for a desktop environment because it's a small speaker. It fits easily under a desk. It'll really pressurize that area that you're listening to. You get tons of bass out of it. And uh, it just sounds so much better when you have the bass right. Then you could plug the ports on those uh, speakers or you could use bass management depending on what preamp you're using. But a subwoofer really works wonders in a desktop environment in, in a 2.1 kind of configuration. You could experiment with the crossover on that. In my old system, I had some RBH speakers and I had a Validine Mini-V subwoofer. I basically ran the speakers um, full range, but I sealed the ports. And then I crossed the subwoofer over at like 60 hertz. And I just had excellent results doing that. Plenty of bass, plenty of clarity out of the speakers by having that subwoofer supplement the last octave and a half that the speakers themselves couldn't do in the desktop environment. So the next step is the desktop audio equipment. You do want to get a good digital to analog converter. If you're just using the sound card on your PC, you're really doing yourself a disservice because unless you have a really high-end dedicated sound card that has its own separate DAC chip and has a really good noise floor, you're degrading the signal. So there's a lot of different um, external DACs you can use. You could buy amplifiers that have a DAC with a USB input on them, like Yamaha, for example, the AS8001. Integrated amplifier has a really good DAC section in it and it'll handle USB. So that's one example. There's a couple examples in this article here and full disclosure, I put some links in here to Amazon and we there are affiliate links. So if you buy anything through these affiliate links, we earn a small commission. You don't have to do it, but it helps the channel out. But there's some examples here. Personally, right now I'm using a Focusrite Scarlett second gen audio interface. I'm doing that to do all of my podcasting here. This is a very good audio um, product. I've had good results with it. That's one example you can use. You plug it into your computer and then you use the DAC function of that as opposed to the DAC function in your sound card. You'll, you will definitely get better sound that way. Here's the big thing. Stay away from computer speakers. And they are, anytime you see in most cases when it's a dedicated computer speaker, it's these little cheesy, um, Logitech Chinese speakers that are full range, one driver and a little bandpass subwoofer. These are not good sounding products. I'm sorry to say Logitech makes great keyboards, great mouse, that kind of stuff. But the, you're not going to get really high fidelity out of this stuff. 
stay away from that. Stick with the consumer audio products. Stick with the Behringer's, the Cali's, you know, the products that we review on our website. If you go to the Audio Hawks loudspeaker review page and you go and you look at uh, the bookshelf section, we have plenty of powered monitors that we reviewed recently that have done really well, that don't cost a lot of money, that are much better alternatives to these, quote, computer speakers. Stay away from those. So now in this article, we, we get more talking about the dispersion characteristics of the speakers. And uh, James is basically saying he recommends wider vertical dispersion speakers. The reason for that is, you know, because you're sitting really close to the speaker, you can hear tonal changes if you stand up or sit down if the speaker doesn't have wide vertical dispersion. So in this case, like an MTM, I'm a huge fan of MTMs where you have mid-range tweet or mid-range Huge fan of those for home theater environments because they have more dynamic range, especially in the mid range, higher sensitivity. They just, they offer a lot of bang for the buck in that ter in type of driver topology as opposed to just a standard two way speaker. But in a near field environment, it's not an ideal speaker because of the off axis lobing vertically purposely done to control the, um, the high frequency uh, dispersion for the ceiling and floor reflections to reduce that. So that's not the right speaker for the desktop. Uh, concentric drivers are actually a pretty good option for desktop speakers like the Kef, for example. I'm not a huge fan of concentric driver speakers for home theater environment because in most cases they have low sensitivity, they can't play too loud, and there's just dynamic limitations to those kind of speakers in most cases unless you get ones that have really big woofers, but I don't want to get too far into that topic. We could do a separate video on that, but there's some great options here that you can look at. Um, here we, we show if you got, if you get a speaker that has a really closely spaced mid range and tweeter that usually indicates it has wide vertical dispersion. There's less lobing issues as opposed to this speaker on the right that has the tweeter really far away from that woofer. That can cause problems if you're sitting really close to the speaker. It really pays It really pays to look at our reviews because we measure the response of these speakers and we give you guidelines on how the speaker should be best used, the listening access, how far away you need for a pop, proper acoustic summation. It really pays a lot of dividends to you guys if you can spend some time reading our reviews, looking at the measurements, educate yourself before you make a purchase. So... Again, I was talking about the MTMs. This is an MTM. Great speaker for a home theater environment, not so great for a near field environment on your desktop. And then here's an example of um, a waveguide on a tweeter. I think this is a Cali speaker. Um, and some of these speakers, you'll find that the axis of integration is either above or below the tweeter. Watch, read our reviews so you can understand where exactly to place these speakers. And then we're talking about um, surround sound. So people are wondering, can you do surround sound in a desktop environment? You can. It's more difficult, obviously, because it's such a small environment. Depending on how your office or your, or your computer area is set up, my advice to you is to get a basic 2.1 system going. Get that right. And then if you want to add surround sound because you're playing games online or you just want to listen to surround sound while you're working, um, in those kind of situations, you probably want to use flush mount products um, in the ceiling or on the back wall for your surround channels. You might not, it, it, I would honestly tell you not even to bother with a center channel. Just use a phantom center channel because if you're in a near field environment, you should have a really anchored center image without that center channel because you're not listening off axis. You're usually listening equidistant from the front speakers. So you really could set up uh, like a 4.1 system for surround sound. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, and that should get you where you need to go. So then James talks about the desktop sound processing. And this is something you really want to pay attention to. When you go into Windows, Windows has a lot of different sound processing. You generally want to turn all that stuff off. You don't want to do any external sound processing through Windows. You want to, if you're doing anything, you want to do equalization through software for the, whatever amplifier you're using. Um, so here he talks about the different steps to you go to manage audio devices in the control panel and you want to make sure you're selecting the right device. So if you have an external DAC, you want to make sure you're actually using that, make sure it's using it for high resolution purposes. And you can see here, it says enable audio enhancements. This is the kind of stuff you want to take off. And then here the default audio, you want to make sure you're at least at 16 bit. 48 kilohertz, 
that's fine. Sometimes if, if I'm doing like um, title has some higher res uh, stuff, or if I'm using J River, for example, I do have some uh, DSD files. I, I tend to listen to those in native, um, but it could, but if you listen to SACD in native, you've got to sometimes go back and switch it to PCM or you could get some external noises in your computer that are just not pretty. So pay attention to the default format when you're listening to high res music and at least set it for two channels, 16 bit, 48 kilohertz is, is, is pretty sufficient in most cases. And here's just more stuff about, you know, the software settings. So another thing to, to consider is the, is the gain matching of the stages. Generally speaking, you want your source device to be at max level and then control the volume, the master volume at the volume level that goes to the amplifier. The reason is, is if you give your amplifier a weak source, you're going to have to gain that source up to be louder and it's going to add more noise because you're turning the gain up. But at the digital end, if you, if you can get the digital output high enough, you have to use less gain at the amplifier side. So it just lowers the noise floor. It's just a good guideline um, to do that. And here's a little flow chart, just so you know. Um, software rise output to 100%. Is there an easy way to adjust it? You just kind of follow these flow chart examples here and you should be able to understand how to set the gain matching of your various stages. And last but not least is the equalization. Um, in, in many cases, when we do reviews of products, we show you the frequency response and then we say, hey, it needs a little more bass or it needs a little more treble to be neutral. You can go into some of the software uh, configuration files here and you can EQ your system. And that could really change things for you. So I would recommend uh, watching some videos on how to EQ your speaker. Preferably if you could do some measurements at the listening area using REW, you can kind of see what's going on with the system. At the very minimum, you want to EQ the bass if you have a big bass bump and you can use a PEQ filter to flatten that out. That would really help. And generally speaking, it's you could do less damage just using shelving filters. So just a very low Q shelving filter if you want to raise the treble or raise the mid-range. When you start doing really pre precise correction with EQ, you got to be careful because if you don't know what you're correcting, it's very hard sometimes to determine if you're correcting a problem with the speaker or if it's a, an acoustical measurement issue because this, the reflections in the room are basically messing up the response. So would, at the very minimum, EQ your bass and then do shelving filters for your mids and highs. And I think that wraps it up. And you can see here's another example of a little uh, speaker system. You know, like Audio Engine, for example, they make really nice desktop speakers as an alternative to, quote, computer speakers. And I'll put some links down below um, for some examples for you guys. And let me get rid of that. So I hope this helped you. I hope this guide helped you. Please make sure you actually read the article because it goes into way more detail than I did in this little short video. Give me some thoughts down below. What kind of a system are you using for your computer desktop audio system? Give us some guidelines on what you follow when you design your system and the results you got. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. You get direct access to me if you want to ask questions or suggest video topics. We also appreciate any of your support to keep the content going. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.